Brian said, I'm the VP of strategy at 88 Quick Store. And in a nutshell, what that means is I get tasked with you know pretty much everything, right? Marketing, uh, training, all that's good stuff. And my goal as part of my job is to help you guys be successful. That's where it, really what it boils down to. And we have a website, uh, we have 888 Board Store, which is our e-commerce site where you can log in as a reseller, you'll get your, your discounted prices and stuff. But the website I run is just voidstore.com. And it is a knowledge portal for you guys. It's tutorials, it's product overviews, there's sales and marketing tips. There's all kinds of stuff on there to help you guys be as, as successful as possible. And that's really what my job is, is to help you guys build your businesses and to make more money. Because if you're buying more product, you know, it goes both ways, right? So I'm gonna go over some things that I think is gonna help you. And uh, well, first off, how many of you guys are traditional IT guys, the computer guy, that if you're, and you're getting into IP, PBXs and stuff? And then how many of you are traditional telephony guys moving into the voiceover IP? Okay, so that's, that's an interesting mix because I, I'm the computer guy. That's, that's what I used to do. I had my own IT business, hundreds of clients, and one day I was asked to help install a new phone system for one of my clients. They were putting in a 3 com NVX system, and part of the deal was that they had to train their IT guy. That was me. And I looked at this and I was, really enjoy my pop. I can do this. I can have this as part of my business, but the three com requirement was just outrageous in order to get to have six salespeople on a twenty-five thousand dollar a month budget and it was it was insane. So I started looking at other op options like Solsys and other products. And at the time I was teaching the MCSE program. I mean I'm a certified MCSE trainer and there was no Windows product out there. So I latched on to the asterisk project and asterisk at home and Tricks box, and I've written a couple books on that, which ended up me getting a job there. And there just was no alternative. And going back to, you know, I was kind of following 3CX and where it was going. And right about uh, the tail end of version 7, version 8 was just getting ready to come out in beta. My big honking Tricks box Pro system that was running my house fried during an electrical storm. So I had to. I'm like, okay, well, what am I going to do? I can either go back to this, which is overkill, go back to CE, where I'm known for, and that day, the version eight, uh, or version, yeah, version eight of 3CX beta came out, and I started taking a look at it. I'm like, this is finally there. Version seven was usable, version eight <coughs> was sellable, in my opinion. With version nine, it got better and better and better, and version 10 brings some really good features to it, and the call center edition is really going to take it into the next level. So I want to kind of start off with the consultation part of it. If you guys are traditional IT guys, which most of you were, it's one thing to go and say, your workstation died, you need another one, or to sell them on a mail server or upgraded bandwidth. But a phone system, completely different beast. It's really a consultative process that a lot of us aren't used to doing. And there's probably a lot of things that you're missing out on when you're trying to sell these phone systems. And we're gonna talk about it, some of those things. An unhappy phone system client is bad. But that's <laughs> really interesting because you guys, you know, like I said, most of you guys are IT guys. I've had calls from customers that would say, oh, you know, my, my workstation it reboots like every, every hour or so. Like, well, how long has it been doing that? Ah, about a month, it's driving me crazy, right? I mean, it's, they'll put up with computer problems forever, but the moment they drop a call, they're screaming at you. They, there is no tolerance for a phone system that's not working properly, where they're just so used to computer problems that it's, it's almost second nature. So you, you gotta make sure that the phone system is rock solid. And you need to get into the customer's head and figure out why they need a new phone system. Not just because you want to sell them one or to try and save minutes, you know, or save a few cents a minute on a phone call, which in some cases is appropriate, but usually it's not. There's usually some something that they don't like about their system. There's some reason why they need to upgrade that they're, you know, they've got some system that it's just too costly to add more extensions to. 
kind of funny, back in our hotel, they're having an Avaya conference today. Did you know that? Uh, <laughs> they can go hand out cards to everybody over there. Uh, what features of their current system can they not live without? I've seen so many systems go in, and they're like, but we needed to do something. And a new, the new phone system doesn't do it, and it ends up getting ripped back out again. And, and the main reasons for changing. When you're trying to deal with the company and trying to figure out what their needs are, who do you think is the single most important person in that company to ask? Receptionist. The receptionist. Not the CEO, not the office manager, not any of those people. It's the receptionist because she handles, or he, I'm not going to be sexist, handles the majority of the phone calls going to that company. They know how the phone system works. They know how calls are managed throughout the company. That's the person that you need to really make happy when it comes to the design changes. So uh, as you'll see on some of these slides, I've got some URLs down here of articles that go into some of these things in a lot more detail. If you just go to VoIPstore.com, go to the blog section, there's a whole section called Sales and Marketing, and there's a lot of uh, articles like this uh, to look at. Then you need to do a site survey and figure out, is the network capable of handling uh, an IPPBX system? Is the firewall in place VoIP friendly? I mean, Kevin's been talking about that. He'll talk more about firewall issues tomorrow. Uh, do you have access to that firewall? If you're selling the phone system, you may not be the IT person there, and you got to make sure that they're going to be willing to open ports or, or do what's, what's needed. Are you going to run a separate network for the data versus phones? Are you, do you need PoE switches? Are you going to put in power bricks? What are all those little things that you need to look at in terms of getting that installation right? How many of you are selling paging and intercom devices today? Two. Count how many paging and intercom devices are in this room right now. In a traditional phone system, analog, traditional PBX phone system, paging and intercom devices make up 25% of the endpoints. How many endpoints did you sell last year? If you sold 100, you missed out on a lot of endpoints in paging and intercom devices. A lot of us will say, well, we just do paging through the phone. Well, what if those phones are in use and you need to do an emergency broadcast? Can't do it. So paging and intercom devices are big, big business. That should be a huge piece of your revenue is putting in overhead systems, old horns in warehouses or out in parking lots where you need to be able to communicate effectively with people that are out there. So look at these devices. Valcom has them. Cyberdata has them. They're, they work just like an endpoint. You can put them in ring groups, you can do all kinds of things, but paging and intercom devices is a huge, huge thing that you need to be looking at. But for, for those of us who are IT people, we don't think about that, so that's why I'm here, teach you about it, right? Do they need headsets? Oh, remote users, what do their networks look like? Uh, is there room for uh, the server rack? Are you going to have to move phone lines from where they were with the old phone system to where they... You're going to put the new server. How about headsets? How many, how many, what percentage of your sales are headsets right now? Probably not very many. Every receptionist needs one. Most executive assistants need one. A lot of managers need them. Headsets, I mean, it may not be a huge margin, but it's incremental revenue. So think about what they want. And everybody's different. There's the double-sided, the one-sided. Women want the one that goes around the back of the head so it doesn't mess their hair up. You know, see? Yeah. yeah. So you got to think about what types of headsets that you're going to offer to take it, uh, to be able to position it properly with those different types of users. And again, more you know, firewall concerns, network concerns. The next step, yes? I said, don't forget, we've actually had people that thought you could use VoIP phones over Wi-Fi. Well, there's Wi-Fi phones. There's the... They all suck. They, they do. <laughs> <laughs> they do. The Linksys iPhone or Cisco iPhone now. I mean, the, the next thing is the, the call flow design. And this needs to be done before you give a quote. I can't tell you how many times I have seen resellers get burned by not doing a call flow design before they did the quote process. They would give them a price for the system, 
and then all of a sudden realize it's going to take them eight hours to do the call flow, or worse, that they want something that you can't physically deliver. So the call flow designing meeting, very, very important. You need to know what you're going to be involved in. I have gone into systems where it was a big company, their call flow was a half a sheet of paper. I've gone into small companies with 15 people, and I kid you not, their call flow, see that whiteboard over there? Twice that size, full of call flow. It took me eight hours just to convert that to a Visio so I could show them what was and was not possible, and I found spots in there where someone could actually be on hold for eight minutes before getting to a person. So I had to go through, figure it out, figure out what was good and bad about it, and then come back and say, okay, that's what you wanted, here's what I'm going to do. And then it took me another eight hours to program that. So had I done that after the quote, that's lost money. So you need to understand what you're getting involved in before you can give them a quote. How do you know how much time it's going to take? You need to get a sign off from all the different department managers, not just the guy that you're dealing with because everyone needs to make sure that their needs are being taken care of. And this can go back and forth a few times. Call flow stuff is not easy and uh, you need to work on this. This is something that as IT guys we're probably not too comfortable with. but. This is a key piece of getting your quote done. Other than the minor technical issues, call flow can make or break a phone system. How many of you have been on the phone with somebody, and I know T-Mobile is probably one of the worst, I mean, Kevin, Kevin and uh, Brian might think Delta might be, but, and you're on the phone listening to their call menu, and they're like, you know, press one for some service, press two, and you start having to hold up your fingers to think which is the best option, right? And you're like, well, press three for something. Press, well, four sounded pretty good. I don't know, maybe four is better than two. How many of you have done that, right? Yeah, so you've got to think about that call flow, and is it going to be efficient and work for the people who are calling into the company? And it, I don't like having call flows that have nine options. I like three options. I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. But work on that flow chart with customers. Have a smaller set. Have submenu. Make it easy to get to somebody. Typical flow chart design. This is what I would present to a customer. I did this in PowerPoint. I usually use Visio. There's online tools like uh, Glippy and, and other products. Uh, if you use OpenOffice, uh, Draw has a, a flow charting tool in it. So you just got to work through the different menus, where do those go, you get to ring groups and call queues, who's in those groups, what happens if no one answers that ring group or call queue, and work your way down so you see exactly what's going on in that system. And then when you're done and you make the sale, you use that as your template and it's also easy to test it. You can work through that and make sure everything is working properly. So it's a guideline for how you're going to program that system in the end. Call queues, are you going to have more callers coming in than you have people to answer the phones? Ring groups, uh, do you need time conditions that you know, change during the course of the day? You know, do they want a different message after hours? You need to take that into consideration. Conference rooms, who is in what groups? Again, minimizing those key presses and minimizing time on hold. The more time someone's on hold, the more likely they are to hang up. So minimize that time on hold. Some basic design guidelines keep the, the level simple. The human brain remembers things in groups of three. So if you can keep it to three options per menu, you're going to have a very effective call menu. Sometimes that's not real easy. Sometimes you have to go four, maybe five, but try and keep it short. If you have a support group, you don't want to have press one for Windows support, press two for Mac support, press three for Windows support, press four for our time and date, press five for accounting. Make it press one for support, and then branch off to another menu that, that gives them more options. So keep those menu options as simple as possible. Good, clean recordings. Audio is going to be very important to people who are calling in, and you want it to sound good. You don't want to pull out a $40 phone and use the built-in call recording stuff that's, that's now in version 10. If you're going to do that, use a really good quality phone, or better yet, have them professionally recorded. Allison Smith, a friend of mine, she has done the voices for every major phone system out there, any talking ATM system out there, 
uh, major companies, and she's not that expensive. She's at the IVRvoice.com. She can do them for you. We have a service where we provide prompts uh, through her, or find someone else that, that you like working with who's got a good voice. Not me, I've done too many. Uh, there, there's jobs I installed four years ago, and it's still my recording. <coughs> it freaks me out when I call in. Uh, walk through the design with each department involved. Think about the potential loops that people can get into. And how can you get to a human? I hate a system. There's no way to get to a human. It just bugs me. Right. Then we have the quote process. Again, overhead paging. Have I stressed this enough yet? Because I'm going to stress it some more later on, too. Very commonly overlooked, but you can make some good money on that. Did you account for installation labor? One of the first mistakes I ever made was a 60 station install, and I didn't take into account that it takes about a minute to pull a phone out of a box, plug it in, try, you know, put it all together. I, you know, I'm misquoted by over an hour. So think about all those different time things that add up when you're doing your install. Again, working hours after hours and weekends. Most phone systems are not installed during business hours. So you may have to pay people more for that, or, or at least take that into consideration. Are there cable drops? So you have one jack or two drops, or how are you handling the cable for the phones? How many of you do line item quotes? Everyone's doing really good full-on proposals, because that's great. Because if you're doing line item quotes, you're probably losing business. Because it allows people to go and shop it. They will go and they'll find cheap companies who are selling out of their back of their garage in their home. I, won't, I should mention their names, but I won't. Uh, but put together a proposal. How does your phone system proposal going to solve their business needs? How does it address their concerns? What features does it offer? And don't show screenshots of the admin section in it. It's pointless. You're probably going to do most of that. But talk about things like the, the 3CX Assistant or the what's now 3CX My Phone. We'll see more of that uh, probably tomorrow. How does this solve their problems and how does it make them more efficient? Given the same price between two competitors, the company that looks the most professional and can convince the company that you're going to solve their needs is going to win that business. It's not going to be based on a line item quote. So I, I strongly discourage you from doing line item quotes like that. Which means that if you are the client, insist on line item quotes. Yes, absolutely. And then go to cheap places that sell, you know, out of the back of their garage or the back of their truck. Yeah. I was going to note that um, a lot of, uh, if you're uh, approved partner of an OEM, a lot of times they require that you are the first line of support for a system that you've installed. So, for instance, in our case, we refuse to service or install a system that they bought from somewhere else because we are responsible for that and we have no idea where it came from. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we order directly from our distributor, we know where it came from and we can service it. So, that's something else that you have is selling a system. You can say, well, fine, if you go out and buy these cheaper, then you have to find somebody else to install them. You know, you can save a hundred bucks and then have somebody screw up the install. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to talk about support contracts as well, because that's going to be really important. Uh, the, and what about questions? Do you need POE switches? Or you, would you rather put in a bunch of AC power bricks? I mean, anytime you go over about 10 phones, it's usually cost effective to put in a uh, power over ethernet switch. Instead of putting in power bricks, they usually cost about 10 bucks a piece. You know, so once you start getting into, you know, 100, 200 bucks, you might as well buy a, a POE switch and then be done with it, and then you have less wiring. Just plug them in and they go. Headsets, again, I'm going to stress that. It's a good sell point. Paging and intercom devices. I, am I stressed this enough yet? Have you got that? Paging and intercom devices. It's big. Security cameras. Is How many of you sell IP security it, cameras? Is it big or are you making it out to be big? No, it's big. It should be big. Because it was big in the traditional telephony world. Anyone who was selling traditional phone systems before, the legacy systems, were selling tons of overhead paging devices. Like I said, look around. How many places can you at least one? It may not be 25% anymore, but I mean, this room's got probably 20 of them in it. Uh, this is an exception. You might not be selling to a Microsoft center, but 
a lot of companies need something either just a simple overhead in the break room or in a warehouse environment where you can page and let people know that it's a small form or something like that. It's an easy sell because most people are used to having it. But back to the next one. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> how many of you are selling IP security cameras? Oh, almost none of you. That, that's kind of interesting. This is going. This is an interesting year for IP surveillance because the cameras are now dropping under the three hundred dollar mark with included software to do all the monitoring, recording, motion detection, alerting, notification, fantastic stuff. What does that have to do with the phone system? Nothing. Except for the fact you're already putting it in, you're already working on their network, you're already giving them a proposal, you have video phones that can now call to the cameras and just pull up the video right away, so it can be used as a time. Yeah? Um, a lot of stuff that we're getting on voice over IP Yeah, those door strikers, door openers, those things are all available today. Uh, they're just SIP devices, you can send in a code, it can open an alarm, it can, or trigger an alarm, it can open a door. Uh, there's a number of different functionalities that they have. Again, Cyberdata has really good products for that. It's cyberdata.net, we have those products. So all those things that people were used to having before are available today, and even more so because some of the, the door intercoms have video on them now. So you can, so when this hit a call button, it can just pop up on your phone, and you see who is back there, and you can have a two-way conversation with them. I have these in my house. I've got cameras all over the place, all pointing at my neighbor because it freaks them out. But that's just, it's just me. Um, but I, I can see when someone comes up to the door. I actually work from home. My office is upstairs. The doorbell rings, and I've got to go downstairs, see who it's at, and I see the UPS guy driving away. So. When the doorbell rings, I just hit a key on my phone, it pops it up, I see him walking away, I know I don't need to go down there right away and just pull up packaging. Or I see it's you know someone trying to <coughs> hand me literature or something, I can just yell at him through the speaker that I have out there. So good things like that. <laughs> Girl Scout cookie. I can let my dogs bark at it. Um, training. You need to provide training, not just to the admin if you're, unless if you're doing the admin, great, I suggest you do that, but you need to include user training. How do you use that phone? How do you do transfers? How do you do conferences? How do you park calls? How do you pick up park calls? How do you use the 3 six assistant or, or my phone? Show them how this thing works. Show them how it, the, the my phone stuff will improve their productivity. If you, you may not get that right at first when I say, that is a productivity tool, but it really is, especially if they have remote users or they they can't see each other because they're all in offices. By using the three six assistant, I can see if somebody's at their desk. I can see if they're on a phone call. If I need to reach somebody, I don't have to call and just let the phone ring. I can see that they're away. No, no use calling them. I can see they're on a phone. It's no use calling them. I can just send them a text message or an instant message right through the assistant. So it enables me to be able to communicate with people more effectively without having to track them down. And that way it improves productivity by not having you have to guess where people are, what they're doing, or how to communicate with them. So uh, definitely train people on the phones and the use of the assistant and uh, in version 10, the 3 6 my phone. How many of you sell support agreements? Good for you, the few of you that are doing it, but the rest of you, you need to work on this. This is recurring revenue. Old phone systems, legacy systems, they all came, it was mandatory that you bought a support contract. You couldn't just buy a phone system and have it put in. It came with a support contract because it locks you to that customer. You're gonna get money every month or every quarter, however you're doing the billing, to sit there and maintain that system. But what goes into a contract, is completely up to you. I'm not gonna tell you how you should do it because it's completely up to the way you do business. Maybe you wanna only provide emergency support. Maybe you only wanna do uh, so many hours a month. Maybe you're doing all the ads, moves, and changes. Maybe you're doing a lot of stuff for them. Uh, sometimes you wanna include extended hardware warranties. You know, next business day replacement of a phone if it goes bad. That means you're gonna have to have stock and you're not gonna be able to ship it out quickly. 
uh, backups. 3CX has a backup system in it that you can run from a command line. So you can write a batch file that backs it up and have it stored on another machine in their office. Better yet, I even have an article on webstore.com tells you how to FTP that file off somewhere. So you can set this up and provide off-site backups of their configurations and their voicemails. Should their system go down, log me into uh, their secretary's machine, change your IP, install the software, do a restore, and you're back up in business. So doing things like this can really provide incremental revenue and recurring revenue to help you build your business even more. I like the fact that it locks you to that client. They're not gonna go and call someone else to do something if they have a contract with you to provide that service. How many of you provide leasing? Again, oh, there's one, uh, two, couple. Leasing is big. If you can provide a low monthly cost to your customer versus a big capital outlay, you may win more business. Not every company wants to do leasing. So you offer it as an option, you find a leasing company in your area, talk to your bank or, or get references from whoever's in your area, uh, find a good quality leasing company that you can work with and your customers will love that. If you're going head to head with someone else and they're gonna be 20 grand, and you're 20 grand, but you can come in at $200 a month instead, that's a lot more attractive than someone having to lay out a bunch of money, especially in these economic times where people are really hard up on cash. Lots of reasons why it preserves credit, or you can get 100% financing, low down payments, buy out plans. But also, you can add your support contract into that lease. I used to do this. I would do leasing, and I would include three years of support into that lease. The entire time of that lease, I was I had that support contract. Now, the downside of this is that you get the money all up front. So you can't tell your wife about that or she'll spend it, right? So the next two years, you're doing work for free. So I had to be very careful about that little policy right there. So uh, if that's a problem for you, you might not want to do that part. But it, it's your money up front <laughs> along with the cost of the hardware. So really good reasons to go with leasing. So again, VoIPstore.com is a knowledge portal. We've got over 100 videos there to help you learn the different products, learn the different features, how the phones interoperate, how to configure different phones, how to configure <coughs> padding gateways, how to configure Sangoma products, how they interoperate together, and how that stuff all comes together to, to help you out. The uh, key URL here for you, boypstore.com slash sales and marketing. Good articles there, more detailed stuff than I've been able to go into here about site surveys, quotes, there's examples of things like that, how to, how to generate leads, how to close more business, some really good articles on there to help you build your business. So um, with that said, thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. Kerry, did you, on the leasing, did you pick up your own paper or did you go through a leasing company? I went through a leasing company. Uh, I had about two or three that I would choose from based on the size. They, they had their, their sweet spots, so I just would go to one of them and it was such a simple process once we got kind of got the ball rolling with a couple of them. So it went really well. Any other questions? Quiet crowd. It must be getting late in the day. That's why I like going right after lunch. Everyone's still still breathing on me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean as a reseller, especially today, which is kind of good because you, you're, you're making a few points on the 3CX software. If you're buying kneeling phones, at least, you're making money on the phones. Other phones, you may not make a whole lot of margin on because there's not a lot of margin in there. And you're, you're making your money on your initial installation. But once you do a support contract, I mean, it may only be a few hundred dollars a month, but it's a few hundred dollars a month. As soon as you have 10 of them, now you're talking a couple grand a month. So why not sell a support contract? It's an easy sell. They're used to having it. The phone system is the single most critical component of a company. Almost every company out there, if their phones are down, they're out of business. Their computers can be down, their email can be down, their internet can be down, all kinds of things can go wrong. But as long as they can make phone calls, they can still do business. 
And so having that peace of mind that they can call someone and have a two hour response, a four hour response, whatever you're charging or whatever they're willing to pay for, like it's gonna give them the peace of mind that you're gonna take care of that in a very prompt manner and make sure that their phone system is running. So. Well, it depends on the price of the system. I mean, and, and that's why it's very hard for me to say, here's the magic formula for doing a support contract. Because it is dependent on the size of the system. You can't, you know, do it for half of the cost of the system. It's, it's going to be usually some percentage of it. And again, fine tune it. You know, if they have a, it may be a small company, maybe they have a huge turnover rate. So there's ad moves and changes every week. So that, that adds up. I've had huge companies that they, they do ad moves and changes like every six months. So it's, like, that wasn't a sellable point to them. So it, it just depended on how each company was. I had no two support contracts that were identical because I fine tuned it for each company based on what their needs were. And so some other people, they just go, here it is, it's done, and it's 10% of the cost of the system. And but ad moves and changes was big in systems that nobody could understand. Mm -hmm. In a 3CX, add moves and changes are two second uh, event that you can transmit compared to the Why would you do that? They don't know that. <laughs> Why would you do that? I mean, that's one of the, you sell it as a simple thing. Well, well, okay, using that same logic, right, for me, doing ads, moves, and changes in an exchange server and setting up all their email stuff, that's only a couple second process, but I'm not going to change a chart, uh, train a secretary to do that. I mean, that's my job as the IT guy. I'm not going to give that up. So why would I give that up on my phone system? That's why when I'm going out and I'm demoing the phone system, I will never, ever, ever do a demo of the admin system. Because then they'll go, well, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I'll show them the front end. I'll show them the user portal. I'll show them the assistant. I'll show them the things that they need to see. I'll show them how the phones work, but I will never show them the admin system because then it looks too easy. So I get a uh, disagreement on that because we have a lot of clients that have come to us for phone systems because their current one, you know, they have to pay over $100 to have the time changed every every six months. Mm -hmm. So we actually were very big with response point. Um, still are. Yeah, that worked out great. Um, but we actually trained a lot of our, like one or two people on site to use the admin. And they would occasionally use it, but we found is that they still called us a lot of times. But they felt better about calling us because they knew that they had the ability to do it themselves. They just didn't want to or didn't have the time. And it it helped bring the trust, that trust it, advisor it, that might be. It really depends on the company. Yeah. I mean, I've certainly sold systems into a company and they had absolutely top notch in house IT guys. And all they wanted was those guys to be trained on it. And at that point, I was hands off. And they'd only call me if there was a problem. Okay, that's great. So, very small support contract, if any. You know, other times it'd be, you know, some level in there where I could say, okay, here's what you can do. Again, it really depends on the company and the people that you're working with. There, there is no magic formula because every company is different. So, that's, that's a valid point. I know how I did it, and I would not show them the admin system because with 3CX it's just too simple. You show them asterisk configuration files, and they're, yeah, and, you know, just like, yeah, I, I won this deal. You know, but 3CX is simple to use, and it's almost too simple when you're, you're showing it to people. It's also can... simple to screw up, and the first time they do that, then they'll start calling you. Yeah, right that's right. true, too. Sure. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Thanks, Gary.